super excited to be able to um, have it. Sorry for the technical difficulties. And um, I don't know, we just kind of spontaneously went over here. So if you could just keep um, your, make sure that your mic is muted so we don't get any feedback on your end. And um, you can use the chat function to post questions for our speaker any, at any point during her talk. And then at the end, we'll ask questions and you can sort of raise your, your hand using the Zoom function or sort of waggle your hands if you're on screen um, or just post it in the chat, whichever you would like. And uh, so I just, just so we can get started, I'm gonna say that um, Joe Cable, our director, I'm Heather Calvert, the executive director for MindCore, and I'm gonna turn it over to Joe Cable, our faculty director who is going to introduce our speaker today. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thanks everybody for, for um, uh, hopping over to Zoom. Um, I'm really excited today to introduce uh, uh, Naomi Leonard. Uh, she's the Edwin Wilsey Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Princeton. Uh, she got her uh, BSc in Mechanical Engineering from Princeton, her PhD in uh, Electrical Engineering from the University of Maryland before returning to Princeton as a faculty member. Um, she's won numerous awards. She's a MacArthur Fellow, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of several uh, engineering and applied math societies. Um, her work uh, focuses on dynamics and control theory in multi-agent systems where those agents can be anything, robots, bird flocks, honeybee swarms, humans. I think today you'll see neurons. Uh, her work is incredibly interdisciplinary. If you look at her website, they have a pool for testing underwater robots. Um, she has worked uh, with uh, oceanographers, ecologists, evolutionary biologists, neuroscientists, psychologists, political scientists, and uh, has worked on several dance pieces as well. Um, so uh, I am uh, very excited uh, to hear her talk today. I think you'll see her interdisciplinary approach in the work that she's speaking about, which is on the stability flexibility dilemma in cognitive control, a dynamical systems perspective. So without further ado. Great, thanks very much. <laughs> thanks everybody for your patience with the technical difficulties. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you uh, today. I'm gonna to talk about um, this uh, story of the stability flexibility dilemma in cognitive control with a dynamical systems perspective. And this is joint work with, um, this is uh, with my colleague, Jonathan Cohen and his group. So uh, the lead authors are his PhD student, Sebastian Muslik and uh, my PhD student, Anastasia Bezieva, also from John's group is, um, Shimei Aragon. And I just also want to give credit to Sebastian for some of the beautiful animation slides that he lent me. Um, so let me just start uh, by telling you what I mean, what we mean by the stability flexibility dilemma in cognitive control. Um, so you can think about, uh, you know, doing two tasks, say, listening to this lecture and checking your email. <laughs> um, and um, uh, we would refer to cognitive stability as the ability to focus on one of those given tasks in the face of distraction. And cognitive flexibility is the ability to rapidly switch between tasks. So, you know, are you concentrating on the task and not getting distracted by your email? You might be, if, if so, then you're, you know, in a stable state. Uh, if you're, um, you know, able to switch back and forth very easily, you're in a flexible state. Um, and uh, the idea is that these are potentially in tension with one another. Um, and there have been studies that suggest um, uh, that uh, neurotransmitters such as dopamine and norepinephrine um, play a significant role in uh, regulating this, this balance between stability, cognitive stability and cognitive um, uh, balance. So, uh, well, where does it come from, this, this dilemma? Um, uh, um, Many uh, theories of cognition um, are grounded on the assumption that there are constraints on the allocation of cognitive control. So that means it's really hard to, um, if you have limits on what you can, um, uh, can do, then it's hard to do lots of tasks. Um, you can circumvent that problem, the, this constraint, by executing tasks in a series, but this is what gives rise to what we're calling the stability uh, flexibility dilemma, because if you are limited in your uh, control, 
um, allocation and then you allocate um, more control to a given task, um, then it's been shown that um, more allocation uh, leads to greater activation of its neural representation, so it becomes more stable, um, but it also leads to greater persistence of that activity upon switching, so it's less easy uh, to switch, um, so you become less flexible. So more allocation, more stable, but less uh, flexible. Um, so the question then came up, uh, and this was work by Sebastian, John, and their colleagues, um, to look not only at, you know, sort of what does limits or what do limits on cognitive control, allocation of cognitive control lead to, but why might there be limits on cognitive control? What value do, might they have? Um, and so they, they developed a model, um, it's a recurrent neural network model, um, and they ran simulations to show that um, and the, the constraints themselves on this uh, ability to allocate control can promote uh, cognitive flexibility at the expense of cognitive stability. That means that just the mere presence of the, alloc of the allocation limit um, allows for um, sort of manipulation of when you need flexibility, um, and then it reduces your stability. So the, so the question that we um, are addressing in this work is, um, do humans adapt their constraints on control in response to demands for flexibility. So if, if you're in a more you know, switchy environment, more flexible environment, are you going to change um, uh, your control allocation? Okay, so that's the, the sort of the first part of the title of the talk. The second part, the subtitle is the dynamical system perspective. Uh, and that's really where um, Anastasia and I come in because um, the idea is, um, not merely to sort of run simulations, but to look at the dynamical system, this model, um, and uh, you know, leverage analytic tractability so that we can um, sort of use principles to derive a hypothesis. Um, and so in particular, uh, we, we set out to do this by using um, uh, this model from uh, Sebastian et al. Uh, which models, again, the amount of control allocated to a task, but it models it as the activity of a processing unit in uh, a recurrent neural network. Um, and what we can prove analytically um, from you know, dynamical systems, using dynamical systems theory tools, is that, um, that in terms of the gains on this activation function inside this recurrent neural network, uh, we can connect higher gains uh, so more um, allocation um, to more stability at the cost of flexibility and lower gains to more flexibility, so lower allocation um, at the cost of stability. Uh, and we can understand this in a very sort of systematic way. And so from this analysis, which I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about, I'm giving you kind of a high level uh, summary here. Um, we can then hypothesize or we can derive a hypothesis, which is that the behavior of the human participants in these experiments uh, that we ran um, in highly flexible environments is best described by a lower gain. So the lower gain um, is our proxy now for higher constraints on control allocation. Um, so with this hypothesis <laughs> derived from our dynamical system perspective, we could then test it um, with human participants. Um, so we, we did these experiments with humans who were performing um, a task switching experiment. Uh, we had two groups of, of, of participants, one that was in a very um, sort of highly um, flexible environment, lots of switching required, and one in a low switching uh, environment. And we fit the model to these to each individual participant, um, so then we could examine um, our hypothesis that um, in whether or not behavior of participants in environments that require higher rates of task switching, where more flexibility is needed, can be best described by a lower a lower gain. We also investigated if participants adapt uh, to this stability flexibility dilemma in a rational manner. So, do are they doing something that's optimal? Um, and we did this by comparing the fitted um, uh, gains or fitted constraints to the optimal gains or optimal constraints on uh, control allocation. 
Okay, so just one further comment about this dynamical systems perspective. Um, uh, I just want to, you know, sort of emphasize that the opportunity by using this kind of model um, where we can um, derive analytic uh, results uh, provides uh, not only this opportunity for a systematic uh, investigation, but also for generalization. So uh, this model that we use is for current neural network model of the activity in this case of two processing units, because we're looking at switching between two tasks, um, is actually a special case of, uh, of a model that we have uh, been uh, working with, um, we derived and have been studying, uh, which you could think of it as maybe a multiple processing unit um, and a multiple dimensional model. So in our processing units, uh, it, you know, they're, each of them is just controlling um, kind of a two-dimensional or even just one-dimensional activity level from sort of activated to not activated. Um, but we could imagine, I mean, in our model, it generalizes so that if that the output of this processing unit were had additional dimensions, not just kind of um, sort of active or non-active, um, our model generalizes that. And then multi-unit, so we could have more than two tasks, we could have many tasks and understand um, uh, how that works. Um, and so the, actually in, in our language, we, we call this model, um, which really does kind of look like a, a, a multi-unit, multi-dimensional uh, recurrent neural network, um, uh, actually with gating, <laughs> for those of you who know about gating, um, it's a, um, we call it a, an opinion dynamics model um, because we're actually thinking about each processing unit in our setting, um, it could also be an agent, a different decision maker. Um, these interconnections could be communication over a network and this, this kind of states, this activity um, could actually refer to opinions and the dimensions could refer to options. So we could have multiple options, multiple agents through a network that are responding to environmental stimulus, internal bias. Um, and um, the key idea here though is that uh, we keep the model simply parameterized. We add a little bit of nonlinearity, which you'll see here, which is very familiar, I think, to those of you who do modeling. It's just a, you know, these uh, saturation functions, sigmoidal saturation function. And nonlinearity, nonlinearity, however, allows for this really rich set of behaviors. It allows for um, multi stability of attractors. Um, it allows for large responses, even to very small inputs. It allows for rapid transitions between one kind of configuration to another, activation state to another. It allows when you're sort of far away from sensitive points for a lot of reliability and robustness to disturbance. Um, and, uh, you know, we use the word tunable sensitivity. We even know if you allow, say, your activation gain, which is gonna be the sort of the, the center of the story here, to have its own feedback dynamics, uh, we can understand how we can tune these implicit thresholds um, or how they might be tuned um, by natural systems um, to distinguish between uh, you know, stimuli or biases that should be responded to versus those that should be regarded as uh, disturbance and reject it. Um, so, but a big piece of this, so I said, well, that sounds like a lot, right? That sounds a lot of complexity. So um, the, the way we get analytic tractability is to leverage symmetry. So that's, that's kind of like taking advantage of some, or even idealizing in some homogeneity um, so that we can understand as a function of a small number of parameters, how to distinguish all the different kinds of qualitative behavioral regimes. And then that gives us kind of a foothold so that then we can understand heterogeneity when, when different inputs are coming in to different um, you know, processing units or agents in the network. Um, um, okay, so that's just kind of by way of um, background. So let me now um, move on to sort of tell this story and um, I wanna tell it uh, carefully. So, so remember the idea here is to is really to sort of sort out why there might be this constraint on, um, on allocation of control. So control signal intensity, um, this activation strength. And um, the way um, uh, we like to think about it um, is thinking about each, um, uh, um, you, know, you know, if you're the control state, 
the control state I'm in, like to follow the, follow the talk or to read my email, um, uh, think of it as, as um, a point in this landscape of attractors. So there are two attractors, right? Which are the, the um, sort of the, the, the dells in each of these um, uh, um, uh, uh, dells here, right? So the bottom of each of these um, valleys. And uh, so if I'm down here, um, then I am uh, uh, in, you know, following, following the talk. Um, and uh, the idea is that the more, um, the sort of the deeper the dell, the, the, the more control I'm, I'm paying, uh, I'm applying to this. And um, uh, the, so the deeper I am, uh, the, the more I'm focused and the more robust I am, the harder it is for me to just sort of like get bumped out because I have, I have a lot uh, longer way to go. Um, however, if I want to um, switch, like if I want to go read my email and I'm really down in this deep well, then, um, uh, you know, it could take a very long time. So this, you know, this is, this is my dilemma, right? Because um, uh, I might be in trouble if there's some urgent email that's going to come in and I'm just, I'm too focused on my, I'm watching the talk. Um, but, you know, I can make a switch between these two, two tasks more easily by um, making the landscape more shallow, right? Shallower, um, right? So that would be the dash line. So if, if I do that, and, you know, just to give you a heads up, this is where we're thinking about the gain, <laughs> controlling how shallow or deep these dells are. Um, uh, you know, this, of course, comes at the expense of of being distracted. So I might be wanting to follow the talk and, and just sort of be on the lookout for the email, but I could actually be distracted if I see something come in that looks kind of interesting, right? So, cause I have a shorter way to go and I could get bumped out. Um, um, uh, okay, so, um, so to explore the effect of this um, uh, and this, this idea of like how this depth <laughs> the attractor depth um, gets uh, controlled in the context of this stability flexibility dilemma. We, we, we model this, this two control state as activities of these two units in the, um, in the neural network. Um, so activation um, can be thought of as uh, the probability of allocating control to one task or the other. So it's a proxy for controlling uh, the behavior. Um, and um, uh, we think of the, um, activation as being sort of monotonically uh, related to uh, performance. Okay, so we're gonna just be interested in the control policy here. Okay, so, so how do we put this model together? We imagine that these two units are mutually inhibiting each other, meaning that the, the network can't pay, attention, can't pay attention to two states at the same time. I can't actually listen to the talk and read my email at the same time, um, right? So this is, um, um, this is you know, sort of one piece of the network. We also imagine that the units can project to themselves to maintain their activity. So this is like sort of self-reinforcing um, and they can receive some kind of net input uh, from uh, two input units uh, that tell the network which tasks to perform. So some kind of cue. Um, uh, and so, um, so, but critically, this is where the nonlinearity comes in. Um, the activity of these units um, is uh, basically a, a, a saturation function, the sigmoid function of their net input. And the gain here, this is the gain I keep talking about, we call it G, it regulates uh, this attractor depth because it basically, you know, the steeper, the higher gain, the, the, the more um, I'm going to react to all these signals and pump up my um, activity. Okay, so, um, uh, whoopsie. So, um, so from the sort of neuroscientific perspective, the gain could reflect the mod modulatory effects of neurotransmitters such as dopamine on uh, processing. So this makes, you know, this makes the problem interesting. Uh, and I'll talk to this a little later and that different levels of gain could be optimal for different types of situations, but also could be different people with different, uh, using different kinds of, um, of gains or modulation of gains. Um, okay, so um, the, the, you know, just down here, I've sort of written, written the equations right here is the uh, sort of the net input, which is this sort of weight on the activity 
uh, of A, this is for the net input into the activity on task A. So I've got this sort of positive self-reinforcing on my own activity level. Whoops, that should say A, B. <laughs> and I have this uh, inhibiting uh, from the activity of B uh, plus uh, this Q that comes into me. And then the dynamics look like this, uh, where I am sort of I'm saturating um, through the sigmoid with a slope of G, this net input. And then I have the sort of the leak uh, associated with that here. Okay, so what do the dynamics look like? So those very equations um, um, showing you on this uh, picture. So this is a plot of uh, the activation of um, for task B versus the activation level for task A, um, given this, this network that we've just defined. So if, if I click, we'll see, okay, so input to A, input to B, input to A, input to B. So this shows a switching or uh, uh, a, a, uh, a uh, network switching between um, uh, sort of activation, uh, control activation uh, for uh, task A in response to an input to, to a Q to A. And then we see how it dynamically moves over uh, to the other attractor when IB is, um, when the task B is getting a Q, right? So input to A, a we get an attractor here. Input to B, we get an attractor here. And we see it sort of crossing, sort of switching um, across um, uh, this sort of axis when we would be indifferent in some sense to which task to do, okay. Um, what's kind of interesting is that if, Let's look at the same story in the case of low gain, so small g um, and high gain, large g. Okay, so it's changed a couple of things, right? It's changed kind of um, like, this is sort of the depth of the, you know, how far I am along this axis here, this, this uh, axis perpendicular to the white line tells me how deep the del is, right? That's sort of how much activation of A versus B, right? Um, so I see this bouncing around because I'm, I'm being asked to do A, then I'm asked to do B. When I have low gain, um, I have a shorter distance to go. I'm not, I'm not as focused, um, but it's also quicker to switch. This guy takes a lot longer for this kind of long path to go. Okay, so you see the difference. Um, Okay, so again, you can think of this as like maybe two different people with different um, uh, attractor landscapes, maybe different profiles of people with different dopamine balance. Um, okay, so, so how do we, you know, I said we had this nice dynamical systems perspective. You've seen kind of a simulation of the dynamical system, but let me, let me show you a little bit more carefully how we do a form anal for formal analysis. Um, so this red line is this line I, I was trying to explain which um, the, the, you know, attractors essentially live you know, along uh, this line. And what we saw was that when, when G got larger, they, the attractor for, for task A moved further um, along in this direction and the attractor for B moved further along in this direction, right? So it's really along this line that we care about what's going on with those dynamics. Um, so let me just show you a, a, another way to see this. So this is a plot of the activation in A versus the activation in B, so, uh, but for different values of G. So I'm basically showing you um, uh, as I increase G, what you are looking at, basically a slice of this for one, for one value of G, like a low value of G and then a high value of G. Um, and uh, you can kind of see that all the actions, so what I'm showing you here are these the tractor states, right? So the solid lines shows you where the tractor states are as a function of G, okay? And this is just, um, this tells you that the, sort of the neutral state um, is, uh, becomes unstable. So we can't see that in the plot that we showed, but it, it's there and it, it drives, um, it drives the dynamics to one or the other attractor. Okay, so here, here is a little, uh, another way to look at it. It's easier if I 
if I kind of don't look at A, a and A, B, but if I actually look along that um, red line, which is the difference. So here's, I'm gonna call act diff, the difference between A, a and A, B, the two. I mean, this is really a measure of like how much control I'm allocating, uh, the magnitude of this, right, to one or the other task. Um, and this is what the dynamics look like. So if you, if you write down the dynamics just for these guys and you plug in what we have for D, the rate of change of A and the rate of change of B, this is the rate of change of the difference in these activation functions. It just looks like this. So we have this leak, we have this hyperbolic tangent. So it's just a saturation of G times itself um, and then plus the input. So this is just like a, a, a unit that's, you know, basically self-reinforced with with a little bit of leak um, and you know the, the slope on the self-reinforcement is G. And then we have some input um, and this is what it looks like, whoopsie. I mean, and this is very easy to understand because of this, I mean, we, we can recognize this from dynamical systems theory as, you know, we just know that this is exactly the, the qualitative picture that we're gonna get. So now um, this is essentially what's going on on that, on that red line, right? So for every value of G, this is the, this is the red line. Um, now, it's, now it's horizontal, okay? Right, because uh, this would be the, you know, this would be the neutral point. Um, and this, this is where the two attractors live when G is right here. This is where the two attractors live when G is here. This is where two attractors live when G is here in the case in which I'm applying no input at all. Uh, in the case where I'm applying, say, a Q to um, task A, to do task A, it looks like this, kind of looks the same like this once I'm out here, um, right? So um, there's, a, there's a lot stronger preference to, to ramp up and do this guy. And then if I switch and I ch choose IB to be positive, I just get the kind of the mirror image, right? Um, and so what we're kind of doing, it, it, it's sort of like switching from here to here, but in this picture, it would be switching from here and then down to here because this curvy line would be down here. Okay. Um, what's interesting is that we can then, you know, with this picture, which we which we we know how to write down analytically, um, we can define formally what we mean by cognitive stability and cognitive flexibility. So this is our our choice, but we've defined cognitive stability here to be this essentially the magnitude, you know, sort of how far you are from from the sort of neutral point to um, it gives you a measure of the depth of the of the of the del of the attractor. You know how much um, activity um, I need, right? So that would be a measure of cognitive stability. So the the, the higher the G, the more uh, cognitive stability I have, right? Um, and then cognitive flexibility is the time to converge through the through the midpoint of the task. So we're, you know how long does it actually take? Right, because you don't necessarily, as we saw, move in a straight line. It, it takes some time, um, and but we can we can suss that out uh, from the dynamics, and that's precisely what we've done here in this study. Okay, so um, this just gives you. Let's re return back to our picture. Remember, we're talking about what goes on along that red line. Okay, and so this is sort of movement along, I guess, along the red line of where the tractor lives. Um, in the case in which I'm giving a Q to A, so that would be in this direction. Um, and it's showing me for two different values of gain, and I'll give you, this is a preview. These are actually the fitted uh, for the two different populations of people that we had, the human participants in our experiment. One group returned a low gain, one group was fitted to a high gain, and this is actually where they sat uh, in this um, fitted model. Um, and uh, in the case in which we put in a cue for um, A, and then uh, we asked them, we would ask them to switch, and here they go. Um, if they were starting here, you can kind of see that they have to make this, this trip all this way. In the case of the higher gain, it's going to take longer. Um, um, and a little lower gain, it takes less, it's going to take less time. Um, because they're less stable, they're further from the, the middle point, right? So, so this gives us a measure of stability. Uh, we can actually compute or estimate um, the transition time, and you can kind of see how the transition time changes for the two different uh, values of the fitted gains uh, for the two different groups. 
Um, but because now we can talk about sort of stability in terms of just the magnitude of act diff as a function of G, and we can talk about the transition time as a function of gain G, this represents stability, this represents flexibility. We can sort of, you know, right now write this one in terms of this one by um, getting rid of G, right? So we can write the time to transition as a function of um, uh, this, you know, magnitude of activity, right? So this is this is sort of an uh, an estimation um, of an expression that tells us how um, how uh, transition time um, and uh, uh, you know activity level are are directly related. So this is the dilemma right here, right? So um, you know, more active, uh, more time, right? Okay, so here is um, uh, the, the experiment. Um, so we ran this, um, uh, uh, this dot uh, uh, motion and color task switching. So um, one uh, task is to look at these dots and um, determine uh, and choose which you, you, know, you think, um, whether the dots are moving up or down, right? And you would hit K if you think they're moving up um, and, and L if you think they're moving down. And, but at the same time, um, you could be looking at this and if you were cued to do the color task, um, then you have to determine and respond to the question, is the majority of the dots blue or red? So you hit K if it's blue and you hit red if it's, and then you hit L if it's red. Okay, so you're using the same cue, the same keys for the two different tasks. So we can talk about, you know, congruency, experiments um, incongruent experiments like you know if if um, you know up in blue um, uh, or, or what's going on uh, when you're switching then it's a congruency because you're you're hitting k if 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 you're asked to hit um, uh, if if, uh, if there's more red um, and the dots are moving up then it's an incongruent um, experiment because you'd have to switch keys to get the right answer um, okay, so um, so essentially the participants um, were um, given um, uh, a series of uh, mini blocks um, and a mini block uh, consisted first of being given a cue. So for example, like the circle would indicate that you're supposed to do the color task. The square would indicate that you're supposed to do the motion task. And then you'd be given uh, well some time uh, to prepare, and then you'd be given a mini block, which would be something I think it was between four and six of these. Although we ended up using only the data on the first one um, uh, in each of these mini blocks, and then you're given lots of these these blocks. So then you execute the task, and then there's this, this sort of time interval between the next mini block, and then you get your next mini block. So you're given a whole bunch of these, um, and you need to um, perform the task. So if you're still thinking about color and you're given the motion task, you might be, you know, making making the wrong choices. Um, uh, so this this allows us to test um, uh, um, performance, both reaction times and accuracy, um, uh, uh, in this task switching setting. And what we did was um, uh, present uh, tasks um, to um, Let's see, I think there were uh, 67 participants in total um, and roughly half of them were getting a very high switching rate. Let me see if I have, no, I don't have that. Um, I have that a little later, something like 75% of the time they were, they were asked to like the one block followed by the next one would be a switch in the task and 25% of them would be um, uh, for the other group. So there's this one group which is often being asked to go from color to motion to color to motion. Another one is getting color, 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 then motion, motion, that kind of thing. Uh, okay, so let me just tell you the sort of the rest of the, the model, right? Because um, uh, I've only sort of spoken about this model over here that describes the control signals, right? But that, but now we're talking about actually doing a task. So, um, uh, you know, you have to, you have to, um, actually make a choice. Um, and so we used this, this sort of the output of these control signals um, to drive uh, a model of um, the decision-making that would represent 
once you've sort of um, you're, you're doing the task, how you make a choice about whether it's moving up and down or whether it's red or blue uh, in the majority. So, um, so this rule module, how we allocate is, is sort of like between trial uh, dynamics and this decision module here is with within trial. So what happens is that we use um, a, um, a drift diffusion equation. So kind of accumulating evidence, uh, noisy evidence uh, where the drift includes um, an automatic uh, signal um, about you know, the, the cue to do the motion task or the cue to do the color task, plus uh, what we're calling the control piece of this, which is sort of, you know, AM is for the, the, the control allocated to the motion task and AC would be the control allocated to the, the color task. And so that's where our AM and AC, our activation uh, comes in. Um, and so once you're given this in, the, in this model, you would then um, accumulate evidence and then there's a threshold crossing of the drift diffusion model that determines whether you've decided left versus right um, or um, uh, uh, blue versus red. Um, and of course, you know, G plays a, a, an important role in all this, right? Because it's, it's affecting um, uh, whether you're paying attention to the right task or not, or whether you might be making a mistake. Um, okay, so with that, that model, so including also the, um, the drift diffusion part for the response, um, there were um, a bunch of simulations run um, in this, this paper that I mentioned at the beginning from 2018 by Sebastian et al. And um, they showed a bunch of things uh, that high gain, uh, so if, if you're getting um, lots of uh, uh, repetitions, um, then um, you want a lot, you want high gain. I mean, you can just concentrate, right? And that, that reduces your uh, reaction time. Um, so you can do things faster. Um, also, uh, you can reduce incongruency costs. Um, so the difference between um, uh, what you get uh, in the um, uh, you know, congruent versus incongruent case um, uh, by, again, increasing your gain. Right, so you're concentrating more, allocating more um, cognitive uh, control. Um, and then, um, but uh, if you increase your gain, this is at the cost of, of switching costs, right? So, this, so, so the model um, is uh, consistent with this idea of the, of the dilemma, right? So increasing gain leads to more stability, which is here, um, but less flexibility, right? There's a cost. Um, and uh, we can also um, compute optimal uh, gains um, uh, and uh, demand for flexibility. So, um, so this would be uh, showing you how as, the, as required to do more switching, the optimal gain uh, goes down, right? You gotta make yourself more flexible. Um, and um, likewise, the intensity of uh, uh, the um, control uh, goes down, whoopsie, uh, which is consistent with a higher uh, gain as you increase the flexibility, the switchiness of the environment. Okay, so, whoops, sorry. Um, okay, so here's the details on, the, on, the, uh, on what we did with this model and then with the, the groups. So um, we had these two experimental groups um, and we used our model uh, on modeled <laughs> groups that had seven, uh, the high switch group had 75% of the time switching, the low switch group um, had 25% of the time switching. We computed the optimal uh, G and uh, we um, uh, came up with a prediction of, of, of behavior. And um, we then ran these experiments um, uh, with just two different groups, um, and we uh, 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 you know, did this fit and, and explored behavior. And we asked this question about whether the model um, uh, predicted well uh, the behavior of the group. Okay, so here is a little bit of what we found. Um, and this, uh, this is actually before we do fitting. So this is looking at the reaction times for the low switch group in the model. Um, 
Uh, so, the, the, you know, repetition performance is better. You're, you're faster than when you have to do a lot of switching. Um, and this was borne out um, uh, to some degree in the human experiments. Um, and then, so this is kind of like stability. And then this is the flexibility piece, which is that, um, that uh, if you're uh, in this low switch rate environment, um, where presumably um, you have a, a, you know, a higher gain, um, uh, you, you, know, you have a larger switch cost. Whereas if you, um, there's a lot of switching, um, you have a lower gain, so you're more flexible and have fewer um, switches. Uh, uh, I mean, you're, you're more flexible and you make your switches more quickly. Um, and that was again, borne out uh, in the experimental data. Um, okay, so then we also fit uh, the data. And so here is a fit of the gain. And this is the 2.5 and two that you saw in the, the earlier slides. So for this uh, low um, task switch frequency group, um, we, we sure enough saw a statistically higher fitted gain um, as compared to the high frequency group. So this is a, this is a nice kind of a result um, that brings some evidence to bear on our hypothesis that one would expect that um, you, know, you would lower your gain. So that was our original question. You know, do we adjust our gains? And it looks like we absolutely do. Um, uh, in, in the presence of environments that require more flexibility, right? Um, but we didn't find that, that people were using what we, would what we had defined as optimal. Um, remember this, this, you know, we had defined um, uh, this uh, trade-off in terms of like time uh, to go from one to the other versus the activity level itself. Um, and so this is the, um, this is the fitted gain versus the optimal gain. And so you can see that the fitted gain um, was um, consistently lower than what we would have um, uh, estimated to have been the optimal gain. So it seems like humans are definitely, uh, are, are adjusting their gains in different kinds of environments, but uh, there may be other factors at work here, right? Uh, because they're not doing what we would have uh, thought might have been the optimal thing. Um, so just, I mean, uh, a couple final words. Um, uh, you know, I've been talking about a single cognitive agent, um, um, but it could be quite interesting um, uh, to think about what happens when we have agents um, that uh, are doing a task kind of together, um, when some of those agents might be different. So we might have an agent that is very flexible, easily distracted um, uh, versus an agent who's uh, sort of more moderate um, in terms of being able to focus on a task. Um, and, you know, it could be that across the population, um, uh, everybody is the same, right? And we could try to understand what it means when you're actually maybe passing signals or cues, um, you know, we're all working on, you know, studying for a test and, but then, you know, um, somebody's got to make sure that we don't miss the bus, right? Um, um, and, but it could be that, unfortunately, that the person who is the most easily distracted is really good at making sure we don't miss the bus, but probably doesn't do so well uh, on the test. Um, so, I mean, so we're trying to um, explore uh, for the future, you know, what might, um, might be uh, interesting questions about sort of, um, uh, the role of uh, diversity in th these kinds of uh, settings. Um, and let me just, you know, just a final word. This is a repeat of that slide um, because I think very deeply about these questions about models and how we can use them for systematic investigation, for deriving hypotheses and testing hypotheses and also generalizing. So we can indeed think about this previous question extension that I mentioned with um, our models, which allow us to look at multiple units. Um, and, uh, um, and um, you know, this idea of, of you know, studying and designing um, decision-making across groups is something that 
um, I have been and continue to be quite interested in. Um, I'll just show you a couple of examples. This one, I, I just went and cut the picture and I realized it's exactly the same network that we've just been staring at. We just, uh, with some colleagues in uh, political science, um, wrote a paper. Um, um, uh, this is sort of uh, for um, a, a special issue that a group of, of um, researchers are involved in to try to look at our tools in dynamical uh, systems to understand um, political polarization. This was a study of um, looking at the nonlinear feedback dynamics of political po polarization in the US and trying to understand its asymmetry. Uh, but as you can see, you know, this is sort of the, you know, the ideological position sort of <laughs> cognitive activity, control activity of the Democrats and this of the Republicans say in the Cong in Congress, we have this sort of mutual inhibition and we also have this self reinforcement exactly. <laughs> it's funny how the, the, the metaphor uh, continues, um, you know, and, and this leads to policy making, which affects citizens, which affects policy mood, which you can think of as input back into uh, the elite level. You know, these, we've explored these kinds of models and, and sort of precisely these kind of qualitative ideas to try to understand, um, you know, how um, over the years, over the decades, um, uh, we can explain, uh, again, as a function of these parameters and these gains, um, what um, what drives them and what leads to uh, political polarization. And this gives us a, a picture of this. This is actually coming out of our model of this measure of um, asymmetry. Um, we, we're also looking on, at it at collective animal behavior. So I've been interested in this for quite some time. This is a study with um, a student, former student and um, biologist Deborah Gordon looking at how the, how the desert harvester ants um, regulate their foraging and sort of remain phenomenally resilient to temperatures and humidity, changes in temperature and humidity in the desert of Arizona. And you can see this kind of very nonlinear, excitable behavior that is very similar to the kinds of dynamics um, that I've been talking about. And then finally, I mentioned that we don't just study uh, in nature, but we also use in design. I and mean, we are thinking about these kind of uh, navigation problems, the sort of human robot interaction, how you, how we like, the little dance we do when we can't walk around somebody. Um, this is just a little example of using these um, on a group of robots in my lab to sort of negotiate um, when they need to decide whether to move to the right or the left of each other. And of course they're doing it very nicely here because whoopsie, sorry, because we're using this, um, this model and we have full control for what they do. <laughs> Uh, so we can design in the appropriate uh, stability, flexibility, dilemma, balance. Uh, so with that, I will say thank you. Um, thanks to my research group, my family and my funders, and thanks for your attention. So thanks, that was a great talk. <laughs> um, and the questions are already flowing in. So I'm, okay. um, uh, I, I have some questions, but I'm gonna let the, I'm gonna give it to the audience. Um, so uh, Needy asks, a uh, very interesting talk, thank you. In your model, why is excitation self-generated but inhibition not self-generated? Uh, so would the results look different if you switch these or added bi-directional arrows for both? Um, it, uh, so I guess it's a, uh, yeah, a question about, uh, uh, you know, yeah, the, so the, 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 the choice sign, of the yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, well, the self uh, reinforcement was meant to um, uh, be there to kind of, um, you know, I'm getting excited about this, I'm going to continue getting excited about that. Um, and ultimately, it, it um, there's a balance between that and the, the leak that we have in the dynamics. So there really is a sort of a negative feedback, positive feedback dynamic that's coming out of that. The mutual inhibition is really that I can't, I'm not doing but sort of like a, maybe it's a population of neurons that's um, you know, in um, tension with this other population. So they both can't be active at the same time. So that's why that we have the inhibition between them. But in our general model, you know, we can have every, possible interconnection with every possible sign. And so you can, you can explore, um, and, I mean, these are sort of the fundamental kinds of behaviors, these, mm -hmm. these you know, um, 
you know, bifurcation diagrams that I showed you. Um, um, but yeah, there, there are all kinds of very interesting questions if you if you muck around with those parameters, um, their magnitudes, and you know, they could be they could be you know different strength and different directions. These kinds of things. Um, these are the kinds of things that we think about in the in the sort of more abstract framework. Um, um, so Kenji has a question. Uh, how can the model accommodate asymmetric situations where people need to prioritize one task over the other? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, you could put that in um, into the, um, so we would do it, we'll be, we, we might do it through that, the input signal, right? So that I is, is a Q, but it could also have with it some kind of um, bias, right? So that, so right now it was just being in the experiment, it was just being um, uh, set by the you know, person running the experiment, right? You were told to do this, but of course, if you're sitting there watching the talk and, and choosing between that and checking your email, you might have your own priorities like, okay, this is really boring. So I can, <laughs> or I really, really need to look at that. Um, uh, so, so you could absolutely weight those, those inputs, right? Um, and I mean, those are, those are precisely the um, kinds of things that we, uh, in fact, we just submitted the paper last night about um, um, how to, um, you know, how can we, um, uh, like in, in some kind of network where there's already heterogeneity because of where you are in the network. Um, and then if we have kind of a distributed input, so some want to do one task more than another, how do you understand what, which way, you know, the group will go or under what conditions you'll, um, the group will split based on different kinds of inputs and where they live in the network. Um, here we only have two, individuals but if there's other kinds of asymmetries um, these are these are the kinds of questions that um, are, are really key so that's a, that's yeah that's a great question mm -hmm. uh, thanks and and Jason has a question uh, amazing talk thank you uh, in neural systems tasks are often not static fixed points but involve dynamical processing. Do you have any thoughts on how the recurrent neural framework might extend to switching between temporal attractors such as limit cycles? Mm. Um, so um, we do uh, we do know that like our model, uh, we, know, we know parameter regimes where we get uh, uh, limit cycles and uh, mm. hop bifurcations. Um, we have only begun to scratch the surface on that, but I think it's a super interesting question. Yeah, about, about, um, I, mean, I don't know, because yeah, equilibria can get boring after a while, right? Uh, limit cycles are, are really interesting. Yeah, so that's a, it's a question for future work for us, but yeah, I like that. Um, I will give a couple seconds for any other questions to come in, and that will give me a, a, a second to ask my question, which was about the, the optimality result that the subjects in the experiment all seem to have lower gain than predicted. And, and that led me to wonder about two, two things. One is what the assumptions of the optimality result were, like what, how you were trading off uh, the, the cost, you know, the benefits and costs of stability and flexibility, right. um, and 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 also, I mean, I guess another thing is, I mean, that that it immediately led me to think is that, in from the subject's perspective, they, there might be other things other than the two tasks, right? And so that the low, <laughs> like, exactly. from their perspective, you know, exactly. everything else that my brain might be doing <laughs> might be a third bin, and so maybe if they're trading off multiple tasks with that. I guess, I guess the question might be, you know, if that were true, would, would at least the directionality of the result make sense that you would want lower gain in order to give you, you know, sort of more flexibility? Yeah, I think that's the nice, inter the, maybe the, the correct interpretation is that, you know, this, this um, you know, you know, the, the, the fitted gain that, you know, 
the, the optimal gain kind of assumes that there's nothing else to do, right? I mean, I mean, it really, well, I mean, it's computed um, to, um, uh, yeah, it's computed to, you know, to, um, oh, yeah, to, to, actually, I don't have in front of me exactly the equations, but um, yeah, to, to, you know, to balance this time, you know, like if you want to do a good job, you, you want to, you know, you need to, um, oh, I, I do remember, let's see. It, uh, it's either reward rate, uh, I remember we did it two ways. Um, it's something like reward rate. Okay, so let's just say it was reward rate. Um, so, so we're trying to uh, optimize reward rate when we're uh, given this, you know, we're using our estimation of, you know, time to transition as that approximation I gave you as a function of the gain and, um, uh, um, you know, how focused you are, you know, how much control you're allocating, which is a function of the gain. So, you know, so A, you know, that had to have been the right way to um, measure those two um, properties, right? And, um, and then reward rate would have to be the right way to determine optimality. Um, I mean, so not a bad place to start, but certainly um, uh, one could imagine that, you know, you're saving your gain for some other stuff too. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll make this the, the last question I wanna, uh, so Claudia asks, um, can, can we use the model to see how people in the field can improve their performance? So I guess, you know, are there any lessons here for, for improving your stability, flexibility trade-offs? For instance, um, you know, uh, people often have to balance two objectives uh, at the same time. So. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, this would be the kind of thing that I would do like for designing, you know, in a designed system, but it would be interesting to think about how you, how you could extract a lesson It'd be fantastic, right? If I'm trying to switch, I mean, I would talk to my kids because they seem to be good at that. But, <laughs> but you know, we're not so trained to do that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you could. I mean, in principle, right? Maybe, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I guess I would have to put that back to you folks to tell me whether you can actually um, consciously, you know, um, mm -hmm. adjust how you control your, you know, distractibility versus, you know, or how you can, I mean, I guess it would be, you know, thinking about, you know, um, how to, you know, you know, I guess, I guess you I mean, people think about how to control, you know, how distracted you are or how focused you are. And, uh, um, but it'd be interesting if there was a way to get around mm -hmm. um, some of the problems, some of the limits, right, in that trade-off. Okay, well, uh, th thanks uh, so much for visiting us uh, today. Um, oh, and thank my pleasure. You talk, um, and thank you to the audience for sticking with us through the switch in platforms. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, is there any uh, anything we need to say at the end? Okay. No, I think it's fine. We'll, um, uh, we will put a recording of this avail. It'll be available on our YouTube channel. And um, thank you so much, Professor Leonard, for your, <laughs> your, your grace under pressure. And I'm sorry for the glitches in our-, in our Oh, system. no worries. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Yeah, have a good weekend. And uh, hopefully, I, it looks like you have the same glorious weather there, so. Yeah, it looks nice. Okay, enjoy it. Okay, thanks. Good to meet thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.